Good to uh, see all of you here this morning. Um, let's bow before we uh, break into the Word of God today. Heavenly Father, we come to you in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Jesus, that you are the great I Am. That you have authority over life and over death. And Lord, you see your people exactly where they are. You see the lost, Lord, and their need for you. And you go out of your way to intersect us, Lord, and to show us who you are and to set us free. God, as we get into this next portion of Scripture in the book of John, we pray, Father, that you would speak through the story that we're about to discuss this morning. And that, Jesus, you would receive all the glory and all the honor, Lord, and that the Holy Spirit would change us, soften us, and help us to understand clearly who you are in a better way today than we did even before this message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, there are miracles that are found in the book of John, the Gospel of John, that are found nowhere else in the New Testament, not in the other synoptic Gospels. And um, Jesus approached his ministry very, I, I would say, in a very calculated way. When we see the stories of Scripture unfold in the Gospels, there is no accident in any stretch of the imagination with any of the things that Jesus did or the sequence in which he did them. Each miracle served a purpose in God's perfect timing to really, re, really reveal a certain message, expressing something about the character and the purposes of God. Today we're going to look at a healing that was performed by Jesus in the book of John, and we're continuing our series in John in chapter 5. Would you please turn with me in your Bibles to follow along, or follow along on our overhead this morning, to John chapter 5, where we talk about God the Son being healer, deliverer, and Savior, starting with verse 1. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. For one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. So this is the setting of our passage this morning where Jesus goes to this place called the Bethesda Pool. Now, the Bethesda Pool was close to the Temple Mount, and history and archaeology has told us that it was near the Antonio Fortress built by the Romans. And in Jesus, this pool was outside of the main walls of Jerusalem. The name for the pool in Aramaic was Bethesda, meaning house of mercy or house of grace. And the pool was actually a catch basin that would catch water that would become available after rains. It was a spring, an intermittent spring. So at periods of time, the springs would run, and at other periods of time, the spring would dry up. So the, the spring would well up through the cracks of the rock at certain times. And, and the Gospel of John describes the Bethesda pool as having five porticles, like we're talking about uh, in ancient architecture, like a patio with pillars with a roof over top. That's what we're talking about. So there's these five porticles. is a puzzling feature um, suggesting that uh, a pool would have five porticles. Well, interestingly enough, um, there was some speculation on this as to whether this even existed or whether this was some sort of um, figurative story. But Archaeology actually has proven this. Um, back in the 19th century, an archaeologist named Conrad Schick 
German archaeologist, excavated around the area, and he found a rectangular pool that was actually comprised of two different basins, and there was evidence that there was, an, in fact, a portico around the entire two pools and one right down the center, dividing the two basins of the pool. So the pool acted as a res the first pool acted as a reservoir for the second pool, which was connected um, uh, through some sort of piping. Um, and the second pool is used as a mikvah. For those of you who don't know what that was, it's a place where people would ceremonially purify themselves. It was also believed to be used at one point in time in the temple as a place where they would wash the sheep near the sheep gate to prepare them for sacrifice on the altars at the temple. So, again, I'm talking to you a little bit about archaeology. Okay? They found a scroll, uh, a copper scroll, in fact, uh, amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls this past century that actually talked about the Bethesda pool. Um, they found uh, the scroll dated between 25 to 70 AD and uh, was found in the community of Qumran, which is near the Dead Sea, where the Dead Sea Scrolls are found. So they found this scroll that actually talked about the pool at Bethesda um, being a place that was used for ceremonial washing. So. All of this is historical. And during the time of Jesus, there was a particular legend circulating um, in that time in the area around the Middle East. There were certain places where people believed that holy healing waters would come and there was supernatural healing that would occur. And it happened in different places, but this one particular pool, there was a superstition that stated that the first person to get into this pool after it was supernaturally stirred by an angel, would be physically healed. So many people with serious illnesses who had placed hope in this legend would spend their days lounging near the pool and would try to be the first ones into the pool when the pool got stirred with the hope of being healed. Now, maybe some of you are going, Pastor Clint, superstition? Okay, I ran into this issue with this passage of scripture, and I'm going to talk to you about it because I've spent a lot of time looking at it. You see, I write superstition because you'll notice that the newer English versions of the Bible do not have verse 4 included with the text. If you've got an old King James Version, verse 4 is included with the text. And I'm going to explain this to you. There's a very good reason for this omission. Um, the earlier translations of the scripture of the Greek texts into English included verse 4, which reads this. I'm going to read it to you in King James. For an angel went down at certain seasons into the pool and troubled the water. Whosoever then, after the first troubling of the water, stepped in was made whole of whatever disease he had. Now, the reason that this verse was included in the first English translations was that the manuscripts that they had at their disposal to translate the Bible from Greek into English were actually from around 1100 AD. Um, some were a little bit newer than that. Some of them were from 1200. But the, manus the Greek manuscripts that they used um, were from 1100 AD. That's 1100 years after the turn of, uh, into the new era. The Greek manuscripts used to translate the King James English version of the Bible were the best manuscripts that were available during the day. They called it uh, a lot of the scriptures that were withdrawn from, you've probably heard of this, Textus Reciprocus was the name of some of the, the, the material that they used to translate into the, into the English language. I want to remind you that your Bible that you read today, that it's in your hands, no matter what translation it is, this Bible that you're reading was not original. The Bible was originally written in Greek and Hebrew. So everything that you have in your hand right now that you read to understand is a translation. It's not the original. Okay. Now these Greek manuscripts included John 5.4 as read. And the King James scholars were true 
to what they had at their disposal, they translated this verse about the angel going down and stirring the waters up. A lot of people have had some trouble with this because, for one, it doesn't make sense that God would create a scenario where the fastest person who is uh, able to jump into this pool was the one that got healed and everyone else didn't. It doesn't make sense. They looked at the Greek in it, and there's Greek structure in it that's different than all the rest of the writings in John. So that's one issue. So even in the King James Version, there's some versions that star it because there is question, even because of the text in Greek, that this might not be from the hand of John. However, in the 400 years that have come since the first translation into English from Greek, archaeology has discovered many, many more manuscripts that predate the 1100 AD manuscripts that were used to translate the first English Bible. And within these manuscripts, there is no John chapter 5, verse 4. So somewhere along the line, someone added this particular part into the text. And it was translated. Not, no one was trying to do anything wrong when they originally grabbed this text and translated it into the English language so that English people could have the Bible. No one had any conspiracies. They weren't trying to do anything. The fact is that a number of, of, of texts or, or um, they're not all texts, they're not all called texts. But a number of, of early archaeological findings of Scripture do not have um, verse 4 in their text. The modern translations use a conglomerate of these, transli- of these original uh, Greek manuscripts that date between 150 and 250 A.D., so, that's why I say superstition. Because there's a reason why Jesus went to this pool. The Lord Jesus went to this pool not because he was focused on the super, supernatural healing qualities of the water that all these crippled people were there to look for. He never went there for that reason. Jesus attended the pool at Bethesda to teach people something about the grace, mercy, and goodness of God and his willingness to meet people exactly where they needed. And their hope for healing could be found in no one else but God himself. Apostle John continues with his account of this event in verse 5 saying, before I get into this, there's going to be some of you that are scratching your heads you're going to be going, what are you talking about? I would encourage you, really do some research on this point if you're curious about it, and you'll see what I'm saying, okay? I'm just bringing you as honestly as possible what it is that's here. So I would encourage you to do some research on your own. But leading into verse 5, the Apostle John continues with his account of this event, saying... One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned he had been in in this condition for a long time, he asked him, Do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I am trying to get in, someone else goes down on ahead of me. Then Jesus said to him, Get up, pick up your mat and walk. At once, the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. So the, the thing is, when you see Jesus and his disciples when they come into this pool at Bethesda, he's looking around and he's looking at all these people who are staring at the waters, just waiting for something to happen, for them to be stirred up 
so that they could rush in and try and get healing. And Jesus is looking at all these people. And there's this man who's been sitting on the portico for 38 years, suffering from his ailment. He's just sitting there. And Jesus, his heart's filled with compassion for this guy. You see, when Jesus came to heal people who had sicknesses of their... Um, all who came to him were healed. There was never an occasion in Jesus' earthly ministry where Jesus re- did not, who, where Jesus refused to heal someone who asked for healing. That being said, it's not as though Christ healed every sick person that he came across in every place that he came across or ventured. Consider what was taking place here at the pool at Bethesda. We know from our text that there were other lame, blind, and paralyzed people in this place. They were all there looking at this healing water to try and escape their circumstance. Why was it just one man that Jesus picked out of the crowd to heal? Why is that? You see, I think it was because of the focus God knows the hearts of people. He knows the broken people that are out there. There are so many broken people in this world, right? But not all people who are broken are willing to look to God to help them. They're looking for all kinds of other things to help them. Concerning this particular passage, um, Charles Spurgeon once put it this way, and I've got it quoted. He says, a multitude of needy people were there, yet none of them looked to Jesus. A blindness had come over the people at the pool, but there they were, and there was Christ who could heal them. But not a single one of them sought him. Their eyes were fixed on the water, expecting it to be troubled. They were so taken up with their own chosen way that the true way was neglected. So instead of seeking out the healer who had come to Jerusalem to heal and to save, the crippled people at the pool of Bethesda huddled around the pool and pinned their hopes on the chance they might be the first one to get into the waters. And this is why Jesus spoke to this man in the way that he did. The man was interesting. He was an interesting case of hope combined with hopelessness. He had hope, or he never would have been there. But yet he was hopeless because for 38 years he had tried to make it into the waters, and he couldn't do it. I'm not sure how many people were there that day when Jesus did this miracle, but I imagine there were scores or perhaps there were hundreds. We don't know how many people were there, but there were other people there that had need too, but... Jesus looked through the crowd and he saw this man's heart crying out, knowing how lost he was, how in despair he was, how he had suffered and how he longed to be delivered by God. There's a similar spiritual blindness on people from Jesus' hometown in Nazareth. Remember when he went to Nazareth? He went to Nazareth, and because he was from the area, they looked at him as the the son of Joseph and Mary, and they knew his brothers and sisters, and, and they wouldn't receive or believe the authority that was resident in Jesus. And Jesus said in that particular case, a prophet is not without honor except in his own town, among his own relatives, and in his own home. He could not do any miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed at their lack of faith. So regarding this lame man that Jesus healed at Bethesda, you can imagine how this man felt. Like he was liberated from a paralysis that kept him from doing anything for 38 years. This poor man probably was laying in his own filth. He probably... No one would help him into this pool. He had nobody. This man was destitute. 
See, regarding this lame man, God didn't put down some sort of protocol formula for him to follow to receive healing from, from him. No superstition to embrace to try and convince God to heal him in a pool that was thought, thought to be stirred up by an angel. God visited this man at this place at this time to show the people that they didn't need magical solutions presented by religious superstitions of different kinds. They didn't need that. He wanted to publicly state the solution to healing what ailed this man was in Jesus Christ and in Jesus Christ alone. He is the Messiah. He is the healing. Only God can raise someone up that is broken in this way. God the Son willingly healed this man to bring glory to the Father in the power of the Spirit. A man like this, can you imagine this poor guy? He would have been an outcast, had nobody that cared for him. In verse 6, when Jesus asked the man if he wanted to go, well, we see that his, his response reflects the state of his despair and his misery over his circumstances. He wanted to be healed. But Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? Why? Not everybody who's sick really wants healing. Jesus asked him, do you want to be healed? And he's like, yes, I do want to be healed. I want to be liberated from the bondage of the circumstances that I find myself in. I want to be healed. And Jesus said, stand up. See, we'll talk about that in a minute, but what is this spirit, what is this miracle illustrating? See, God didn't just put this miracle here for just a reason to show that he healed a sick man or, or a paralyzed man. He didn't just put it there for that reason. There is deeper roots to this than meet the eye, and we need to explore this. You see, this miracle was to illustrate a significant spiritual principle with a physical illustration of healing on this man physically. The crippled man illustrates a vivid picture of how completely helpless and hopelessly lost we are in our sins. We're broken and beaten and our sins have wrecked us to the point where we cannot do anything. And any time we try to do something to fix ourselves, we find ourselves incapable of doing it. Like a crippled man, when the Lord approaches us, we're bound by our disease, unable to see the spiritual healing we need through the systems of the of the world, through the systems of man's religions and superstitions. You can try and make yourself better by being a good religious person, but I can I'm going to tell you this: this story is here to show you that it doesn't matter how good of a person you are and how what kind of religious systems that you follow you're not going to be healed by those systems because the only person that can heal you and save you and take away the the things that are binding you is Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. He is God. He is Lord over all. And He is the one that all eyes need to be focused on. See, God called him. And as, and as with the crippled man, we desperately need healing. We desperately need to be set free from the chains that bind us because our sins, they have effect on us. They keep us from being who we were made to be. And as with this crippled man, For sinners, not only does God ask people if they want to be healed, but he also gives them the power to get up and to walk when they cannot walk on their own. God in his mercy never tells anyone 
anything without giving them the power to do it. Did you know that? The power is not from themselves. That blind man, that crippled man didn't get up on his own steam, per se. That, that crippled man got up because he was infused with the ability to get up by the Lord, by the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord came upon him. And the recovery was not gradual. It was instantaneous. He was immediately healed. Limbs that were moments before useless were instantaneously made strong by the Lord. The man responded to God's call for obedience. And despite it being on the Sabbath day, and in spite of the traditions of the scribes and the Pharisees, which, which would say don't lift any kind of burden on the Sabbath, he picked up his mat in obedience to Jesus and began to walk. Instantaneously healed. Wow. Verse 9b. The day on which this took place was a Sabbath. And so the Jewish leader said to the man who had been healed, It is the Sabbath. The law forbids you to carry your mat. But he replied, The man who made me well said to me, Pick up your mat and walk. So, hmm. So they asked him, who is this fellow who told you to pick it up and walk? Boy, they were mad now. The man who was healed had no idea who it was, for Jesus had slipped away into the crowd that was there. <laughs> wow. So I mean, here's this guy who's been laying by this pool crippled for 38 years. He's up carrying his mat going, thank you God for healing me. And the religious people of the day couldn't think of anything but the fact that he had broken protocol with their traditions. He did things differently than they thought he should have done. Oh my. Lest we think that these guys are just... I mean, they weren't... They were, were not in tune with God's Spirit. Is it possible for us not to be tuned in, tuned into God's Spirit at times? Guess what? But for the grace of God, I go the path of the Pharisee. I do. You do too. So there's two issues at hand here. Here you have this guy who's gotten up and he's so happy. Oh, no longer paralyzed in his legs and his arms. And he could walk about and go about his life in freedom now. Right on. I'm set free from the consequences of the brokenness that I find myself in really because of the fall. You know, sometimes people get sick and it's not some sin that they've committed. This guy, we don't know what he... I mean, sometimes sickness does come from sin and sometimes it's just part of humanness because the curse is on us. We're not... Not one of you guys here is leaving this place on your own two feet unless you're lifted out of here in the rapture. They're going to be carrying you out somewhere and burying you. That's the fact. As much as we don't like to think about it sometimes, that's what's going to happen. The curse of sin is upon all of creation. And this temporary state that we find ourselves in is not perfect. Okay, so we have the Pharisee issue, right? They're so focused on the fact that Jesus broke protocol with what they thought, what their religious thoughts were, that they condemned Jesus for raising a man out of his bed that's been there for 38 years. Oh my. But there is another issue at hand here. See, Jesus, Jesus is so patient. But he speaks truth. See, because this man who had been lifted up out of his, out of his crippled bed, okay, he had other issues at play as well. It wasn't just the malady that came upon him because of his sin, the consequences, you might say, of sin. It wasn't just the consequences of corruption upon him that was crippling him and chaining him down. He also had another issue. He had an issue of the heart that needed to come to where God wanted it to come to. See, 
in verse 14. This man, Jesus left before this guy could even find out his name, but Jesus just found him later. Verse 14, later Jesus found him at the temple and said to him, see you are well again. Stop sinning or something worse may happen to you. The man went away and told the Jewish leaders that it was Jesus who had made him well. Well, so the wonderful thing had been done where Jesus had healed this man of an incurable disease that was not going to be healed any other way. He'd been restored to perfect health. And not only did Jesus restore this man from the illness that had bound him for 38 years, but Jesus also called the man to repentance. You see, God's desire in saving us is not only to heal us from the consequences that we find ourselves entangled in because of our sins. That's not his only purpose. Yes, that is part of his purpose. But his entire purpose is found in fulfillment when we receive eternal life, having come to salvation in him at the end of the day, we come into his kingdom and we are totally, our salvation is complete. You're in process right now. But God wants you, when you decide to follow him, not just to seek him because it makes you feel better inside, because the burdens of your sin and the entanglements of your sin have somehow been lifted off you as a burden. He doesn't save you just to make you feel good. He, makes, he saves you so that you can be at one with him. That's the point. He wants you to be at one with him. At one with him in spirit. Not just your physical circumstances here on the earth. Yes, there are benefits to serving the Lord. If you follow the Lord, it's going to make your life you know, good in some areas. You're not always going to have um, an easy time of it because the Bible promises that we're going to suffer sometimes for our own good. But what I'm trying to say is this, okay? Last week, I stated, God calls us to salvation, and if there's genuine salvation, it must be accompanied by repentance. It must be. This is the same story, again, as what Jesus was trying to do with the woman at the well. Same story. God calls us to salvation, and if there's to be genuine salvation, it must be accompanied by repentance. The Lord reminds this man that because he had been so highly favored by God, who set him free from the consequences of what his sin had, there was therefore a new responsibility A solemn obligation, you might say, to submit his whole life to God, to be someone who bows the knee of his entire being to the Lordship of Christ. Jesus, I don't want just to know about you. I don't just want to be saved from the consequences of my sin. I want to be saved by you from the power of my sin over me. Because God says, be holy as I am holy. Thus says the Lord. There is no be a Christian and sort of give part of yourself to God. That's not how it works. When God calls you to save you, he calls you to save you, to heal you, and deliver you from the power of sin. Is it saying here, is it Jesus coming to this man saying, hey, you can no longer make any mistakes or you're making bad decisions. No longer make them, right? You have to stop. Because if you don't, hell is the, hell is the result. It, it, the context of this, folks, is not about whether we make mistakes. Because in the road of sanctification, you're going to make bad decisions, you're going to make mistakes. But you cannot be a follower of Jesus Christ if you come to him and say a prayer on your lips, but deny him the lordship of your heart, you can't do it because you must, before salvation is possible, there must be repentance. You've got to let go. You've got to say, Jesus, I want you to take me, to change me, and set me on a new course. That's where salvation comes. You see, this is the purpose of what Jesus did in coming back to this man is to emphasize this. There is a spiritual lesson in this. 
God is holy. He desires that his children follow him in lifestyles of holiness. He didn't say sin as little as possible. He said sin no more. In other words, a heart commitment of repentance. Are we going to blow it? Yep. If anyone does sin, the Bible says we have an advocate. Thank the Lord, because guess what? If there wasn't this advocate in my defense, there'd be a pile of ash right here right now. There'd be an awful lot of pile of, <laughs> of ashes in this place, right? Because we're not perfect. We're being made. We're being conformed into the image of Christ, which means we're learning. So we're talking about a heart that desires to please the Lord that is going to need some confirmation along the way, conforming. But you can't come to Christ and say, I want, I want all of my consequences to be evaporated, but I'm not willing to give you this part of my life. Folks, there's going to be many people on the day of judgment that will say, Lord, 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 didn't we do this, that, and the other thing in your name? And what is he going to say? Away from me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. That's a scary thing. Scary. And God's not willing that any should go to that. Jesus stretched out his arms and willingly allowed them to pound the spikes through his wrists and his feet and hang on the cross. He willingly allowed them to beat him when he's the creator of the universe and he could have called on legions of angels to rescue him. He willingly did this so that you wouldn't have to face the wrath of God over your sin. God made Jesus the sin bearer for you and for me so that we could be liberated and set free but not to continue on the path that actually binds us to destruction. But to be clear of that and find new life in him, this is what it means to be born again in the spirit. Born again. Newness of life. Okay. Ah. <sighs> coming back to the man who was healed of his infirmities and telling him what he did. Jesus was very clear that sin brings terrible consequences that are beyond this physical realm. They're eternal. You would think the religious community would be overjoyed and filled with awe and thanksgiving to God for setting this poor fellow free. You'd think that. But that's not how man's religion works. See, Jesus did something that upset the legalism of the religious community. See, legalistic religious people are more concerned with conforming things to the way they think they should be done in the style that they want it than they are with people being set free from the bondage of sin. They're more concerned about form and how they think it should happen than they are about a soul that suffered for years. As a matter of fact, they're angry when Jesus calls such a vagabond to the faith, particularly when it doesn't happen the way they think it should. Oh my, I'm not saying, I'm not pointing any fingers, I'm just saying that in our, in, our, in our own flesh, we can become religious and pharisaic if we're not careful. We have to be very careful, people, or we'll fall into the same pride that the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the scribes fell into. You see, their, their religion was not based on, the, on the, the things that Christ desired them to have their, their, their religion based on. Christ, is, his whole perspective is about love. Love. 
I'm not talking mushy-gushy love that has no boundaries and no consequences. Do what you think. Love, feel good love. No, no, no. I'm talking about biblical love with boundaries that, that wants what's best, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love that never fails. See, this poor man was bound by an illness. And, and Jesus breached one of the man-made parameters that they placed on the law of Moses. You see, the law of Moses, these guys, they actually actually got their, 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 their law, I guess, their traditional law, not the spirit of the law, but their traditional law. They took the law of Moses, they took the principle of the law of Moses, and they fashioned around it human laws that would define very carefully the, the, what the law said so that within one law that was overarching for a purpose, there became thousands of tiny little laws on how they should act and how they should behave and what should be done here and what should be done there and how this isn't right and da 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 On it goes. Different. I hope you can catch what I'm trying to get at this morning here. You guys catch what I'm trying to say? You see, the law of the Sabbath is an important law. It's important for us to rest. It's important for us to recover from our week of work. God said that we're supposed to take, and this is part of the New Testament as well, we're supposed to take a day of rest. A day where we rest from our labor so that our body recovers, our mind recovers, we recover from our week of work, and so we can have a day so we can focus on Jesus, we can focus on the Lord and His work and all the things that He's done, and, and just have this day that we work with, that we don't work our normal activities, and we have a break, and we have a time of refreshing in the spirit. That's that's what it is. Okay, in ancient Israel. Okay, now this is where the Pharisees got their little thing. Okay, in ancient Israel, during the time of Jeremiah, the kings of 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 Israel were completely disregarding all of the law of Moses. They were worshiping idols. They were just basically doing whatever they wanted to do, disregarding God's laws. Period. And in Jeremiah 17, Jeremiah addresses it. But he's not just talking about the Sabbath. He's talking about the heart of these people. Right? Jeremiah says, this is what the Lord says in Jeremiah 17, 21. Be careful not to carry a load on the Sabbath day or bring it through the gates of Jerusalem. Do not bring a load out of your houses or do any work on the Sabbath, but keep the Sabbath day holy I commanded, as I commanded your ancestors. Yet they did not listen or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and would not listen or respond to discipline. Whew, that's the context. Here are all these kings and all the people were just like, ah, God, whatever. I'm going to do what I want. That's what they were doing. Further to this in verse 27, Jeremiah says, but if you do not obey me to keep the Sabbath day holy by not carrying a load as you come through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle an unquenchable fire in the gates of Jerusalem that will consume her fortresses. God said it right there. Folks, if you want to disregard what God has given you, there's going to be consequences to that. In fact, this came to pass. Jerusalem was burned, the gates were burned, and the people were hauled off into exile. But that's not the point. You see, what was happening here, okay, is the Pharisees and the teachers of the law took this passage of Scripture and they loaded their own interpretation onto it with thousands of different rules to show how this was supposed to work. As a matter of fact, in my research, I found that in this time period, if you were a woman and you wore a brooch, you were breaking the law of God. You were sinning. If you had a needle stuck in your coat, in the fabric of your coat, you were breaking the law of God and you were sinning against the Lord. If you actually took something, like even your wooden teeth or your wooden leg and you put it on, that was that was against the law of the Pharisees because you're not to carry a load. So don't put on your wooden peg leg and don't put on your wooden teeth and walk out into public. It was gums only on Sabbath. <laughs> this is what they were doing. As a matter of fact, 
The man who was carrying his bed on the Sabbath day was breaking the rabbinic, rabbinic law because on this day it was said, if anyone carries any, this was from the Pharisees and scribes, if anyone carries anything from a public place to a private house on the Sabbath intentionally, he is punishable by death by stoning. Serious business. You wonder why this guy? It's like, hey, I was just following orders here. <laughs> right? They were angry. They didn't care if he got healed from a 38-year infirmity. They were angry that he crossed the line and how dare they, Jesus, this man, cross their traditions. See, what God intended for freedom, Sabbath was intended for man, not man for the Sabbath. What God intended for freedom and rest and refreshing was turned into the slavery of people by the religion of man. So because Jesus, in verse 16 we hear, was doing these things on the Sabbath, the Jewish leaders began to persecute him. In his defense, Jesus said to them, my father is always at work to this very day, and I too am working. <gasps> Talk about add gasoline to the fire. <laughs> you hear that? So these guys are condemning Jesus for, for asking this guy to pick up his bed and leave after healing him. Right? They're condemning him because he broke their rabbinic law, which was an add-on to Moses' law. Jesus goes, my father is always at his work to this very day. In other words, you guys got this all wrong. The father is still working. And I am the son of God, and I'm working too. You see, working and resting from physical work was one thing. God wanted people to take a day of rest from their physical work. In the six days of creation, God did his creative work. And on the seventh day, he rested. And we're supposed to rest on the seventh day from our physical work. However, Jesus told the religious leaders, if you want to consider the work of mercy and compassion and showing someone grace that is suffering, on the Sabbath, if you want to consider that work, you are terribly mistaken. My work and my Father's work continue because every day is a day that I reach the heart of man in compassion. There is no breaking from that, and nor should there be from you. That's what he was saying. And for this reason, in verse 18 we see, they tried all the more to kill him not only was he breaking the Sabbath, he was even calling God his own Father, making himself equal with God. There's going to be some people that you're going to run into that say, the Bible doesn't teach that Jesus was God. Yes, it does. The Bible very clearly teaches that Jesus was God the Son in the flesh. And he was here on the earth under mission from God the Father in the power of God the Holy Spirit. And Jesus has done his work and he will continue to do his work. So today if you're here and you're broken and you don't know where to turn, you're so bound by the sin that's held you fast, I want you to know that there is a God in heaven who saves, delivers, and heals, and he loves you, and he calls you by name, and he says, do you want to be healed? And today is the day of salvation. Today is the day that you can say, yes, Lord, I want to be healed. And Jesus says, then get up. Take your mat from where you've been laying over this pool of superstition Take it and walk away from it because you don't need that. All you need is me. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. There is power in the name of Jesus because there is no name by which man shall be saved in this world except for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you can be set free from your bondage, your chains, your sin today. All he asks is you say, yes, Lord. And step out in faith and take a stand. And as you stand, strength will fill your spiritual limbs and you'll come to life and you'll see things that you never thought possible because in all your own personal efforts to try and get better, you failed and you haven't been able to see it. 
But in one moment, one moment, God will give you strength in your limbs and you will rise a new person in him. And then what he will say is, go in the power of my spirit and sin no more. Repent from the way that you're doing things before and come to me, the author of life, and I will give you the strength to carry it out. That's what he says. Amen. Oh, God is good. He is good. And he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. Just as Jesus found that man at the Beth Bethesda pool. He comes to save us from the desperation of our circumstances, of our broken hearts, of our entanglements, our chains, to bring us to new life in Him. You don't need angels to save you. You don't need religious systems of man that are created by man as if it's a a step-by-step -step thing that you have to take in order to realize salvation. All you have to do is say, God, I'm a sinner. I need you. Jesus, you came as God's representative to me. You came as God in the flesh. Why? Because you love me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For the Son of God did not come into the world to condemn the world but to save the world through him. You are God's creation and he wants you to be whole. So what's it going to be? What's it going to be? Will you obey or you go like the other people at the pool and look to other things, other spiritual things, systems that were created by man or demons or whatever. Legalistic people, legalistic religious people say that you've got to work through your terms the way we want you to to be saved. And Jesus says, no, come as you are, and I'll change who you are. Amen. Would you pray with me? Jesus, thank you for each person that's here today. God, help us in our weakness to see things the way that you see them. God, if there's a person here today that doesn't know you, Jesus, I, I, I just pray that they would surrender to your call. If you're here today and that's you, ask Jesus to be your Savior and your Lord and say, I surrender all. My chains are gone. That's what amazing grace is all about. So would you come to the Lord today? If you're here and you've never given your heart, your spirit to Jesus, I'd love to pray with you. If you're listening online and you've never given your heart to Jesus, you can pray. It doesn't have to be fancy. It doesn't have to be in some format. All it needs to say is, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I can't do it on my own. I need you. Forgive me for my sin. I know that you're the Lamb of God. You're the one who takes away sin. Would you take my sin upon you and take my sin away and give me your new life? It's all you need to do. And Christians here today, help us, God help us not to be caught in the same kind of mindset as the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the teachers of the law. In our humanness, our pride wants to go there, but we can't allow that. Let's have a heart to realize it's not method that brings people to Christ. It's the message and the work of Christ that does it alone. People don't necessarily have to do it our way to serve the Lord, but they do have to do it God's way. In Jesus' name.